In this short video, I'm going to take you through some tips on bringing together the evidence, the first step of the Be Alert process. Now, the first question that often comes up when you refer to bringing together the evidence is, is what evidence? At this point, you have to remind yourself that the customer has taken time out of their day to come to your service department because they're convinced they've got a problem. And this can only be based on the fact that they've experienced some sort of symptoms. If you look up symptoms in a dictionary, it describes them as a sign or indication of something acting as evidence. Now sometimes these symptoms are obvious. Maybe the vehicle is misfiring or leaking fluid. And this obviously helps you to locate the fault. But what about those jobs we all love where they turn up and the fault is no longer present? This is when we must ensure we gather all the evidence that's convinced the customer that they've got a problem. So the most common question that pops up at this point is, well, where do I start? Now clearly, to find out what symptoms the customer has experienced, you need to ask them questions. But what we don't want to do is waste their time by just asking them random questions. You need to be asking questions in a structured way. You need to be finding out about specific information. You need to find, ask them questions that lets them talk freely and describe what it is they've experienced. And you also need to make sure that your questioning leaves no stone unturned. It's worth pointing out that the Be Alert process is partly built on hindsight because when we analyse why a job has become a problem job and took too long to diagnose, we can then see what we should have done to avoid this. Bringing together the evidence correctly is one of the main reasons that jobs turn into problem jobs. So, on to the killer question. How do I start? One of the pieces of information that you must establish is when the customer started experiencing this problem. This is known as the change point, and it's the point at which the performance of part of the vehicle, let's say the engine, suddenly dropped. This could also be the air conditioning or, or anything else. Now hindsight tells us that the change points can commonly be since a vehicle has had either um, an accident or maybe a service has been carried out or maybe they've had a new windscreen or uh, accessory fitted. Have you ever had a similar experience of when you say, well, you never mentioned this problem started ever since it came back from the body shop? It's a classic case of hindsight and something that you can make sure doesn't catch you out again by using the Be Alert process and asking the customer about when the fault started. Bear in mind that sometimes they won't have a change point. This, because, uh, this could be because the, it's a normal feature of the vehicle or maybe it's, it's, they've just purchased the car like this. So... To get all this information out of the customer, we need to use the correct type of question techniques. This is achieved by using open questions. These are typically questions that, are not, that don't require a yes or no answer. Open questions therefore get the customer to think about and describe the fault in their own words. Open questions typically start with what or when, where, who, why or how. Remembering which open questions you should ask can be made easier by the phrase five bums on a rugby post. This is a reminder of the five W's that you need to ask and the rugby post being the H of the how. So use open questions to find out about the environmental conditions in which the fault occurs such as day, night, hot, cold and things like that. It's important not to interrupt the customer when answering or try and finish their answers for them. Just let them explain as much as they can. Collecting evidence can be compared uh, to the collection of water because you start off with a broad open question such as um, when did you first notice these symptoms? This is a really good way of finding out the change point. Once this has happened and you've got the answers this will inevitably lead you to asking more open questions. However, once you've got all this you need to gain facts and this is done by asking closed questions. Closed questions are questions that require a yes or no answer. Here's a good example of a closed question. So, does it only occur in wet weather? A good example of how to finish this off then is by paraphrasing. 
paraphrasing is basically when you say what the customer has said to you back to them in the form of a question. It's a very, very effective way of making sure that you've not misunderstood them, you're clarifying what they mean, and you're gaining the customer's confidence. A really good example of paraphrasing is, so what you're saying is, it only happens when you drive in wet weather. It's at this point they might say, well, no, that's not what I'm saying, and correct you. Or they'll say, yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. So with all this questioning on board, the evidence is starting to pile up. But there's other evidence that you can get. With the information that you've got so far, it's now really relevant to ask the customer if they can demonstrate the fault to you. If they can't, don't worry. You should carry out a full function test of the vehicle. You may find that testing all the vehicle proves that other faults have gone unnoticed. For example, a cigarette lighter might not be working and the customer never realised. Again, more evidence that might lead you to the problem. The answer to the questions make it more likely for you to make the fault to reoccur. So you can do the functions test when the vehicle is wet or in cold weather, for example. Another thing you can do for additional sensors is use your own personal sensors looking for damage of wear, maybe spilt drinks or a wet carpet. Smelling for signs of excessive heat such as burnt transmission oil or clutch linings. Listening for signs of whistling, creaking, clicking or dripping which a customer may think is normal. Feeling for signs of unusual bumps or bulges, hot pipes that should be cold, cold parts of the engine that should be hot, all very useful. You should also now with this pile of evidence Make sure you haven't overlooked a TPI that's relevant and also look up the vehicle history and see what jobs this vehicle has had on it before. A really important point though while doing all this is don't destroy the evidence. Again, the B alert process is built on hindsight and a classic fault that we've seen recently is where a customer is going absolutely crazy with a fault that occurs every day but can never be reproduced in the workshop. Just so happens that every time the technician brings the vehicle into the workshop, he slides, he slides the seat back because he's considerably taller than the customer, but when the seat is slid forward again by the customer, the fault reoccurs. So, in summary, how am I going to remember all this? Make sure you try and start off by finding the change point. When did the fault start occurring? Make sure you find this out by using open questions to let the customer talk and then nailing the facts with closed questions. If you can't remember what questions to ask, remember the five bombs on a rugby post. Do a function test or preferably get the customer to demonstrate the fault to you. Use your senses, see if you can smell, see or, or hear anything of relevance. Make sure you check TPIs and, and job cards and this way you will have a great big pile of evidence. But finally, one more point. It really doesn't matter who gathers this evidence so long as somebody does it. Now, if you're following a service call process, it's common practice that the service advisor will speak to the customer. It doesn't mean that they shouldn't be collecting evidence. You could pass them the be alert pad and let them capture down the information that we've just spoke about. This has got all the reminders of the five bombs on the rugby post and the things that you should be asking. However, if the service advisor has not asked the questions that you prefer at stage three at customer check-in, this is your chance to ask those questions. Without this evidence, it's pointless trying to carry on because you're going to overlook something. Hindsight has proved that to us. However, with this pile of evidence, you're ready to go on to step two of the be alert process. And when you nail the whole process, you will fix this car right first time and help Volkswagen Group achieve their targets in right first time fix. Thanks for listening to this short video. Please help yourself to the other five videos. Hi there, in this short video, I'm going to take you through some tips on analysing the evidence, the second step of the be alert process. To start this step, you need to do something that's difficult, something that's counterintuitive to a technician. You need to slow down. At this point, you're going to have a great big pile of evidence. You've no doubt just clocked on and the 
clock is quite literally ticking and everything is telling you to just crack on and if you do you might just fix it but it's going to be a great shame if you've gone to the trouble of collecting all this evidence to then not analyze it so be warned most jobs become problem jobs because the process is not completed fully and it's usually step one or step two that have been missed so before you go diving in you really need to ask yourself is this actually a fault with the amount of systems used on today's vehicles and the amount of settings available for a customer to adapt it's very difficult for a customer to understand how everything should work and this makes it very easy for a customer to misinterpret a normal system reaction as a fault something that could suggest that there is no fault is there may be a lack of change point so ask yourself is it a known fault use ElsaPro or ODIS to check through the TPIs that are recommended in the DIS report this will ensure that you don't start to diagnose a complaint that already has a technical solution created by the factory and then if you decide that it is a fault and it's not a known fault then you can now go through the results of your function tests to categorize the evidence into two piles of what is working and what is not working for example an automatic transmission may have first third and fourth gear that is working and reverse and fifth gear that is not working categorizing your evidence is a very effective way of assisting you in identifying any common denominators so in this example you could then look at what common components are used for fifth and reverse gears as it's unlikely you've got more than one failure but it is very very likely that one thing has failed that's common to both gears it's also just as useful to look at the components that are used for first third and fourth because these components can be deemed as working and removed from any lists of things that need checking using what is what is not may also point out that a system does actually work okay for one driver but not the other you can also cross-reference the evidence you have to see if the change point coincides with a service or repair that they've recently had some accessories that they had fitted last month um, has the gearbox fault started ever since that phone kit was fitted or has that ESP fault coincided with the new rims that they had fitted all this analysis is now starting to give you a really good idea as to the whereabouts that this fault could be and maybe even what caused it although all of your evidence must be considered it's important to be mindful that some of it may be coincidental or of no relevance so it's important to not let any evidence that makes no sense lead you away from the hard facts for example a customer may have a vehicle that does not start intermittently and you may also have been told that the rear view mirror vibrates a lot now these faults may be connected however the hard facts for starting an engine are it needs fuel either air and petrol or diesel it needs ignition and it needs to be mechanically sound with compression and timing so you must focus your thoughts on what could stop the engine from starting rather than what could cause both of these faults when you eventually find the fault it's possible that you'll also find the fault with the mirror but if not it was a coincidence and therefore would have been a red herring so in summary slow down don't dive straight in and try and locate the fault just yet experience tells us that missing step two is a common reason for struggling to diagnose a complaint validate if it is actually a fault and not a feature and ensure it's not already known about it's pretty embarrassing to find out there's a TPI after two hours of diagnosis categorize your evidence into piles of what is and what is not this will then make common denominators obvious like a particular driver or a common component analyze the change point to see if it coincides with something else that happened like an accessory being fitted or maybe an accident repair and finally watch out for red herrings concentrate on fixing one fault and after you have you may find that they're all fixed if you do this correctly you'll be ready to locate the fault and support a first time fix and remember the be alert notepads are, are available to help you out with this process thanks for watching this short video for information on how to complete the remaining four steps 
check out the other videos. Hi there, I'm going to take you through some tips on locating faults, the third step of the B-Alert process. So a quick reminder, this is a six step process. So if you've not carried out steps one and two, it's simply not going to work. You need to now have the evidence you collected in step one. You must have analysed this to give you some common denominators or good areas to start looking at in your diagnosis. And if you haven't and you're jumping straight to step three, it's simply not going to work. You're going the wrong way and you're about to waste a lot of time. So go back. If you have carried out these two steps with a little bit of forward planning, you're in a really good place to go on and locate the fault. So normal question, where do I start? You need to say to yourself, can I reproduce these conditions that I identified in step one? If the engine only starts when it's freezing cold, you really need to be diagnosing that engine when it's freezing cold. And this isn't always that simple. So if you can't reproduce the conditions, you need to make sure that you've either got some more evidence in the lines of common denominators or change points. If you've got no common denominators, no change points, and you can't reproduce the conditions, it is incredibly unlikely that you're going to be able to diagnose an intermittent fault. So you need to go back to steps one and two and try and get more evidence. If you can reproduce them or if you've got this evidence, we're ready to create a plan of attack. The most important thing is that we don't just start diagnosing via a scattergun approach of randomly testing the vehicle anywhere. Equally, it might seem a good idea, but we really don't want to start testing a system from one end all the way through to the other, which is sometimes called point-to-point -point testing. Both, both of these methods are probably going to get you the fault eventually, but they're very, very inefficient ways of diagnosing a vehicle, and they're going to waste a lot of time. So here's some tips on how to do it efficiently. So this is all about narrowing down the area that the fault could lie in as efficiently and as quickly as possible. Now there's a few good methods that will help you do this and they'll depend on whether the fault is mechanical, like a rattle, or electrical, like a horn not working. The method I'm going to show you is going to work really well for both types of faults. It's called the half split approach and it's pretty much exactly as it sounds you split the circuit or the vehicle into two halves. Any halves, it doesn't really matter. In my example, we've got an annoying clunk when driving and we don't know whereabouts it's coming from. So I've split the vehicle into two halves. The next thing you need to do is choose a piece of equipment that lends itself to the type of fault you've got. This could be anything like a refrigerant leak tester, um, a fibre optic a loop brake tester or chassis ears. It could be a multimeter, it really doesn't matter. So the best tool in my example is VAG 1842, the ultrasonic chassis ears that's available to everybody through the tool hire scheme. What you do is you get the two channels or sensors from this kit and you place one in each half of the vehicle. You then get someone to drive the vehicle and you listen very carefully with the tool to identify where the fault is. And in this example we hear the clicking or the clunking coming from the back of the vehicle. All you do now is simply repeat the process by splitting the rear of the vehicle into two halves. Now we can hear in channel 1 that the fault is clunking away on the right hand side of the vehicle. So, repeating the, proce the process a third time will tell us again in a smaller area where the fault is coming from. Now, do you see, when I carry this out three times, I'm always going to narrow down the fault to one-eighth of the circuit or the vehicle. What I could do now is go on to place one sensor on the body and one on the, su on the suspension, and it will narrow it down even further still. It's very, very useful. 
Now let me show you how to do this on an electrical fault. So on the top there we can see that the customer is complaining of two horns not working. So I'm going to pull up the current flow diagram or it could be a pneumatic circuit or a schematic. What I want to do now is split this circuit into two halves but just looking at this we can see hang on a minute we've got two circuits here because we've got a relay we've got a primary circuit and a secondary circuit so I'm just going to pick one it doesn't matter which I'm going to pick the primary circuit now I'm going to split it into two halves and basic electric testing tells us that really we should be testing at the consumer so I'm going to test at the consumer and it's going to either pass or fail the fault is either going to be in the first half or the second half. Whichever half the fault is in, we then split in half again. So in this example, the fault is in the other half. So I test that again, and then again, and just as before with the clunk, um, in three simple tests, I've split this circuit down to one eighth of the circuit. But what if the um, fault wasn't in the first half, and wasn't in the second. Well this would um, tell us that the fault would have been in the secondary part of the circuit. So again I just carry out the same process. I split the, the secondary part of this circuit in half, test it, find the fault um, faulted half, test it again and very very quickly I isolate it down um, to a very small area of the electric circuit. Now you may have noticed that I didn't mention any evidence or, or any analysis that had gone on here. Um, I want to show you this process again, but this time when somebody had actually brought together the evidence with a customer and carried out things like function tests. In this scenario, they noticed when they listened carefully that both horns were not making any noise whatsoever. So the circuit was completely inoperative. But also when listening, they also heard that the horn relay was clicking. Well, when you look at the circuit and you analyze this, you can see that that means the primary side of the circuit is working. So already we've isolated the supply wires, the coil, some more wires, the switch, some more wires, the earth point. And if this, has been, if this was the same earth point used for the horns, that would have been even better. But unfortunately, in this case, it's not. However, we've got two horns not working. And it's incredibly unlikely that we've got either two faulty horns or two faulty earths. Because they are both different wires and different earth points. So if we look at common denominators, again, that narrows it down even further to one wire and one switch and one connector point. So this has done an incredibly good job of isolating the fault right down to one piece of wire and one switch before I've even decided to go anywhere near the vehicle with a test probe. So using the bringing together the evidence, the analysis of common denominators and the half split approach is going to isolate this problem in an incredibly efficient manner. So it is very very important that before you start going up to the vehicle you focus your evidence and make a plan of where you're going to test first and then second and then second if the if the first test was both a pass or a fail. If you do this, you're not going to get distracted because it is so easy once you go to the car and do the first test to then get sidetracked and start testing things randomly again. Or worse still, you'll test something that you've already eliminated in your analysis. So, if you decide, like here, that you, you think that the fault is a, a connector, um, here's some tips on how to test the connector. When you look at a connector, if you decide to give it a bit of a wiggle or a touch or a pull and, and, and see how tight it is, all you're doing there is testing the connector plastic body. You're not testing the electrical pins. 
So we're going to do something called drag testing. And to do that, you need to start by unlatching the connector. Secondly, you need to very carefully undo or, or remove any locking clip or tool from that connector body. The third step is, using the special equipment, you can carefully unlatch the electrical wiring pin from the connector body and pull it out from the plastic housing. The next step is to then reconnect the wire without the connector body and then drag it backwards and forwards on the pin to see if there is any resistance when you're pulling. This should feel very, very similar to when testing with a feeler gauge. There should be a significant amount of resistance there. If the pins are loose, then they must be replaced using the processors as detailed in ELSA and the wire repairing kit. So, in summary, this is a six step process. If you've not done steps one and two, you must go back. Don't try and randomly test the car anywhere and please don't test from one end of the circuit to the other. It just wastes time. You must make a plan of attack. Use things like the half split approach be it on a mechanical fault or an electrical fault. And if it is an electrical fault, write down on the circuit first what it is you're going to test before you go to the car. And this will stop you from getting distracted or testing things that you've already eliminated. Finally, remember you can use the Be Alert Pad because this is really going to help to focus your mind and keep you on the, the track of steps one, two and three. If you do this, you're going to be one step closer to fixing the fault right first time. Thanks for viewing this short video. For more information on how to complete the other three steps, check out the other videos. Hi there, in this short video I'm going to take you through some tips on establishing and eliminating the cause, the fourth step of the Be Alert process. Fantastic, you found it, with some good questioning, some careful analysis of the evidence and a little bit of forward planning, you've gone straight to the fault, a very small piece of damaged wiring hidden away in the engine bay and that's really satisfying. So great, we can repair it and get it back to the customer can't we? Definitely not, in fact this is exactly why we get repeat repairs. Remember this person? Absolutely furious that the car has broken down again. So unless we identify why this has happened and chafed through, it's very likely that they're going to break down yet again. So again, where do I start? Well, we've got a couple of tips to show you exactly how to establish and eliminate the cause of a fault. Here's an example of diagnosing a typical complaint. So a customer's vehicle has recovered to your workshop because it's broken down. You ensure that you bring together as much evidence as possible. You analyse it and create a plan of how to diagnose the problem. In a short space of time, you identify that the cat is blocked. And you know that if you fit a catalyst, it's going to return back to the customer and probably break down again. So what you must now do is consider every possible permutation as to why this catalyst has blocked up. Now if you think about it yourself, you may come up with two or three reasons as to why the cat blocked. But maybe if you check these out, none of them are the true reason. So what if you ask someone else? A service advisor may also come up with a good idea. Maybe a colleague at tea break will come up with another idea too. And the more people you ask, the more things that there are that you can consider. What's clear at this point is, the more people you speak to, and the more things that are considered give you lots of different things to check out as to why the cat may have blocked up. The problem is it's not always that easy to talk to so many people. So using a cause and effect analysis tool will do exactly that for you to make sure that you've considered absolutely everything. The cause and effect fishbone is called that due to it looking like the skeleton of a fish when completed. 
The fishbone was devised by Professor Ishikawa and is designed to make sure that you consider all possible causes of a problem. You start off by drawing a straight line and a head for the fish's spine and then drawing three lines for the fish's spines going up and three going down. Each spine is then labelled with a category as follows. Material. Is there something wrong with the substance the cat is made from? Method. Is it being fitted correctly? Manpower. Is the vehicle being operated correctly? Measurement. Are your expectations of how the cat lasts realistic? Machine. Is it the vehicle that's affecting the component? And environment. Is the vehicle being used in the correct conditions? The idea is that these areas cover every eventuality. So if you've considered them all, you've thought of everything. So I'll now work through these again, writing down the possible causes against the relevant area as follows. This time, even though I may not have had the luxury of speaking to some of my colleagues, the fishbone has reminded me to consider every area. It's worth pointing out that some areas you may not think of anything for, but the very fact that you've contemplated it means that you're unlikely to forget anything. So I've now got a list of things to check through to establish what caused the damage to the cat before I go and fit a new one and complete the rest of the process. Another useful tool is called the five whys. Exactly as it sounds, when you find the fault you ask yourself why five times. So, why is the cat blocked? Because the vehicle was overfueling. Why is it overfueling? because the injector's stuck open. Why is the injector stuck open? Because the fuel's dirty. And why is the fuel dirty? Because the vehicle hasn't been serviced. So in this example, the root cause of your damaged catalyst is because the customer is not having his vehicle serviced. Only when you fix this root cause will the problem go away. So there's little point in fitting a new catalytic converter unless this customer is prepared to have more frequent services. Another really good example of the five wires being used on an air conditioning fault. You bring together the evidence and you find out it's ever since the vehicle was in the body shop. The history tells you that only the rear end of the vehicle has been worked on. You do a function test. The pipes are neither hot or cold. You can smell refrigerant in the engine bay and you can see it dripping off the pressure relief valve. You put this evidence together and decide the best thing to do is see if there's any gas in the system. And you've located the fault. There's no gas in the system ever since this vehicle has been in the body shop. But why? So you check out the pressure relief valves on Elsapro to find that they open if the vehicle gets very hot. But why has this vehicle got very hot compared with others? The body shop manager confirms it's just been painted the same way as anything else but he also confirms that there is refrigerant on the floor of the spray booth. But why? So you speak to the painter and he confirms that he painted it via the normal process. The only difference is he used a different paint. But why would a different paint make the air conditioning leak? So you check out the process for painting with this new paint and on Elsapro it tells you that if you are to use the oven at a higher setting you must remove the air conditioning gas first or it will leak. When you look at the instructions for the new paint, it requires the vehicle to be baked at a higher temperature. So you've sussed it. They've painted with different paint, they've baked the vehicle at a higher temperature and they've not read Elsapro and consequently all the gas has leaked out via the relief valve. You may think that this is enough and you can stop here, but if we drill down one more time why didn't they drain the gas out? That's because it turns out they've got no idea how to use Elsapro and that there was so much information on there. There is the true root cause of this problem. The fact that they're not going on any service training means that they don't know how to pull out the information from Elsapro and they're working on vehicles without the instructions. So the only thing left to do now is to eliminate the cause. In the example of the block catalyst, you established the customer was not having frequent services and so hopefully this has now educated the customer into the cost of not servicing the vehicle correctly. This will therefore 
have eliminated the cause. In the example of the air conditioning leak, again, this would have cost the body shop some considerable amount of money. So hopefully they've now enrolled into some courses so they can use Elsa Pro and the cause would have been eliminated again. In the first example that I showed you, a wire had chafed through. Now what if you establish the cause was the harness not being clipped in correctly when the vehicle was built? You won't be able to work out what the root cause of this is because it may be down to a process at the factory. And you may also think that you can't eliminate the cause because it's out of your hands. But this is not the case. You can have a big effect on the quality process at the factory by completing the relevant section of a disk report and letting them know what's happened. This is exactly what a disk report is for, tracking trends in complaints. So the factory will process this information and follow a root cause analysis just like you did to find out where the harness is not being clipped in properly. So in summary, it's absolutely essential that you work out exactly why this occurred. If you don't, it's likely to come back again. Make sure you consider every possible reason as to what could have caused this to happen. Discuss it with your colleagues if you want, but ensure to use a root cause analysis tool like the fishbone to ensure you've thought of everything. Use the five whys to drill down to the root cause, because it's quick and effective. Make sure you eliminate the cause, and remember, send disk reports in to help out with the build quality. But remember, use the Be Alert pad because this is there as a reminder to help you. It's even got the fishbone pre-drawn on the pages. Carried out correctly, you are another step closer to fixing the vehicle right first time and helping Volkswagen Group in achieving their business goals of increasing customer satisfaction even higher. Thanks for viewing this short video. For more information on how to complete the remaining two steps, check out the rest of the videos. Hi there, I'm going to talk to you about repairing the fault, the fifth step of the B-Alert process. As an experienced and accredited technician, you'll undoubtedly have a wealth of skills and knowledge in repairing vehicles. And it's for this reason that a large number of day-to-day -day tasks get performed without having to refer to ElsaPro. And this may have been acceptable practice a few years ago, but with the huge leap in technology that vehicles have made, it's incredibly likely that you'll be overlooking some vital instructions. Did you know, for example, that many headlight repairs nowadays require the use of an electronic discharge table mat? This also goes for some ABS repairs. Did you know that when fitted new air conditioning compressors, they must be drained of a specific calculated quantity of oil before they can be refitted? And did you know that some software downloads are not possible to be completed unless you have the driver's door open? Well, if you answered no to any of these, then they're really good examples of why you must refer to Elsa Pro before carrying out a repair. Incidentally, we've recently had someone attempt a TPI 12 times only to find out they've disregarded a very simple instruction. So in summary, irrespective of how experienced you are, make sure you follow the instructions in Elsa Pro or in a TPI. Don't assume that the process hasn't changed. Remember the Be Alert notepad is there as a reminder to support you through this process. And carried out correctly, you're now only one step away from fixing the vehicle right first time and helping Volkswagen Group in achieving our business goals of increasing customer satisfaction even higher. Thanks for viewing this short video. For information on how to complete the remaining step, check out the last video. Hi there, in this last short video I'm going to take you through some tips on testing the vehicle completely, the last step of the Be Alert process. If you're confident that you've located the fault, eliminated the cause and repaired it correctly, this may seem like a pointless task. However, it's a small but vital step in ensuring you avoid a dissatisfied customer. This is why retesting the vehicle is one of the steps of the service call process. So in order to test the fault effectively, you must ensure that you test it in the same conditions that were indicated during step one 
when you brought together the evidence. Exactly the same rules apply here as they did when you verified the fault, because if you can't test a vehicle in the exact conditions, it's impossible to be sure if you've achieved a first time fix. Just the same as step one, you must carry out a function test to ensure any other symptoms have gone, and more importantly, you haven't caused any new ones. Again, this should be carried out in the same method as step one, ensuring that you try out any systems available to the customer. Ensure you check them all at the same time as well, to apply maximum load to any electrical connections. Use all of your sensors the same way, making sure that the smell has gone now, or that hot pipe now feels cold, or that clicking noise is gone. And if specialist equipment was used, make sure that you use it again. For example, when checking that a clicking noise has been fixed, it's best to reuse the chassis ears. Now that you've verified your repair, you must ensure that you've left the vehicle how you found it, both physically and electrically, by ensuring the customer's personal belongings are replaced where you found them, returning any seating and mirror positions back to where they were, and returning any electrical settings back to where they were, such as radio, infotainment and heating. Failure to carry out these simple checks can ruin a customer's experience, even though you may have carried out a very accurate and efficient fix. Next, you must ensure that any event memories have been erased from the entire vehicle. Failure to erase the event memories may go unnoticed by the customer, but they can cause great confusion the next time the vehicle is worked on. Best practice recommends that the relevant guide of fault finding test plan is carried out again to validate the repair. However, this may not be relevant in the case of some mechanical repairs. Now you're confident that you've successfully fixed the customer's concern, it's important that you report it to the factory. As previously mentioned, if a customer has a concern verified, then a disk report would have been opened. However, if the disk report is not closed correctly, it will not be received by the factory and they'll be unaware of the problem. So this raises a common question, who is responsible for filling out the disk report? As the person who has diagnosed and repaired the fault, you are responsible for filling out the section that lists the workshop findings and actions. But who's responsible for closing the disk report? The person who is responsible for closing down the repair order and signing off the quality control is also the person responsible for closing the disk report as part of step 5 of the service call process. This person should be the workshop controller unless you've got a dedicated quality controller. So, in summary, retest the vehicle in the same conditions as when the fault occurred using function tests, your sensors and any equipment that you used in step one. Make sure you put everything back as you found it. Don't upset the customer at this late stage by leaving the radio on a different channel. And ensure all event memories are deleted and use guide of fault finding to validate the repair where appropriate. Remember the Be Alert pad is there as a reminder to support you in completing the whole process. Carried out correctly, you're now ready to return the vehicle to the customer and you've just increased your right first time rate. Thanks for watching this short video. We really hope it helps you with your first time fix.